Hey guys, thanks for joining us again for another week on the Best of the West Book Club with me and Dr. Robillard, ex-Eton, ex-Oxford, and we're going through a selection of texts that we think give you a great introduction to the problems facing the West today. And all of these are neglected by contemporary academia and schools. Coriolanus, Shakespeare's great study of what you do with warriors when they come mm. home from war and how do you integrate them into peacetime. It's also more broadly an exploration of the problem of men and masculinity. What mm. do we do to integrate men generally into society? This is one of the big questions that all cultures have to answer. And I think our culture in particular today is having some difficulties with it. What would you say, Mike? Oh, yes. Yeah, certainly. It's, it's, a, it's a perennial issue that uh, you see through, through each generation, through, you know, the ancients, through Shakespeare to, to now uh, with each returning generation. Um, yeah. What do you what do you do with the returning warriors? And then, yeah, what do you do with uh, tox toxically masculine men, so to speak, in the uh, in the uh, the domestic space? And Coriolanus sure. is the the toxically masculine protagonist here. Yeah, it is, I think, along with the Iliad, probably the best study of what's good about masculinity and also what can go wrong with it mm -hmm. in the Western canon. And I've always treated Shakespeare as a political philosopher, someone who's mm. doing the same kind of things that you get in philosophy proper, but just through the artistic medium. And it mm -hmm. took me a long time to figure that out. Um, Schopenhauer has got a great comment that the artist is doing in concreto what the philosopher is doing in abstracto. Mm. So when you're reading a fictional work, you're still engaging with the same kind of concepts that you would in a more theoretical one. Have you mm. found that? Yeah, certainly. Certainly. Yeah. I think that that's um, especially too, when you look at, you know, different ideas that are coming out at the same same time through these different mediums it, it gives you a really panoramic account of the the, the zeitgeist uh, that certain cultures and times are dealing with right and the perennial problems as well the things that are mm -hmm. always there because they're rooted in human nature yeah that's what makes yep. a, a classic work of literature a classic is that mm -hmm. it really attacks on a metaphysical front yes yep all right great let's uh Begin with our normal prayer, then you're leading this time, Mike. And mm -hmm. anybody at home, please join in with us as normal. Right, let's bring it up. Come, Holy Spirit, divine creator, true source of light and fountain of wisdom. Pour forth your brilliance upon my dense intellect. Dissipate the darkness which covers me, that of sin and of ignorance. Grant me a penetrating mind to understand, a retentive memory, method and ease in learning, the lucidity to comprehend, and abundant grace in expressing myself. Guide the beginning of my work, direct its progress, and bring it to successful completion. This I ask through Jesus Christ, true God and true man, living and reigning with you and the Father forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Why do we like this prayer, Mike? Once again, for uh, folks tuning in uh, for the first time, this really hits on the point that sin darkens the intellect and makes you dumb so the uh the opposite of that is what we're praying for here is that uh god's grace will uh shed light through this uh veil of sin or uh diminished intellect that we've we've acquired that's it not completely wounded and depraved but in both will and intellect we are wounded and this is why if you look at the history of philosophy there's pretty much no position so absurd that somebody hasn't tried to defend it <laughs> yeah and it's difficult to account for otherwise and it's the reason why we get the ten commandments why revelation is necessary because otherwise fallen man is just simply going to carry on darkening and darkening, making more and more ridiculous mistakes, mm -hmm. never ending in the argument. Yep. Okay, great. So prayer out the way. And hopefully what we can do now is give people a quick overview of this play and why we've selected it by using the trailer to the 
film version with Ray Fiennes and Gerard Butler, which I think did a pretty good job of highlighting some of the themes that we want to draw attention to. Mm -hmm. So if all goes well with this software, it should be coming up in a second. We'll pause it as we go through and give you some commentary. My name is Caius Martius Coriolanus. If ever again I meet him, he's mine, or I am his. I just want to stop here, Mike, and talk about that head-to-head -head encounter. If ever I meet him again, he is mine, or I am his, with the two generals, the Roman and the Volscian. Mm. What theme do you think this is really exploring with the face-to-face -face encounter? Well, I think these are both men of really an honor society type of culture where it would be the case that the the officers and the generals were the ones that squared off in a trial by champions type of setting whether it's david and goliath or um achilles versus uh, i'm figuring his Hector, opponent Hector. there you go yeah but yeah so this this is of the the old guard honor culture where you're um yeah, you're expecting your officers and your leadership that they're the ones that are going to be the, the tip of the spear against one another. Right. Just from the top of my head, I think the word honor occurs more times in this play than any other Shakespeare play. Mm. Um, I'll have to double check it, but I've got in my memory from when I last taught this a few years ago when I was at Eaton still, it's up in the 60s, I think. So right. they were obsessed with it. So that's exactly the point that they're drawing attention to here. It's very much a question of honor and virtue, what it means to be a man and proving this in combat. Um, mm -hmm. Virtue, etymologically, we've got the, the double root of like um, strength and, and valor, but specifically in combat. And it mm -hmm. goes back to the word for man as well. And for the Romans in particular, these things were very closely linked. So we get the young Martius before he gets the title Coriolanus. Um, he proves himself in war, described as um, initiated into manhood age 16. So that was like the, the coming of age threshold for him, combat. Right. And then just etym et etymologically for people aren't following, what's, what's the word that we're tracing here with virtue? Oh, virtue, vir, V-I-R. So yes, a virtue of virility, veer, weir, yeah. Exactly, yeah. To our noble consul, Coriolanus. Heavens bless my lord and husband. You are a traitor to the people. Right. Right. Me, traitor. Marcus is worthy of death. All right, next big thing then. So he has taken the city of Coriolis and he's got the honorary title Coriolanus. But the people aren't grateful. This is a big thing, isn't it? So you fight for your country, you win military glory. And then when you return, you're not well received by everybody. Yeah, the uh, the civilians whom he protected or fought on behalf of don't agree with him, don't get along with him. And then the, the politicians that sent him and his men off to war don't get along with him either. So, yeah, he's uh, in somewhat of a, an odd tension with, with society. And this is something that, again, is timeless, isn't it? This isn't just a problem unique to ancient Rome. No, not at all. The um, the other thing that comes to mind is um, that really sums this up quite well is um, Kipling's Tommy, where you know you uh, 
oh, it's Tommy this and Tommy that, Tommy go away, but it's thank you, Mr. Atkins, when the band begins to play. So it's like, yeah, the society, they, they want the warrior when they need him, but when they don't need him, he's, uh, he's not well received. Exactly. That's the big tension, isn't it? And you can see the frustration brewing there because in some of his speeches later, there's a contempt for the people who, in his mind, simply wouldn't be safe without him mm -hmm. and no. don't sufficiently honor and praise the heroic virtues that are the foundation of the mere possibility of mm -hmm. any other kind of life. Because how are you going to practice any of the others if you're dead, right? Right, right. This is... um. This is, I think, one of the things that Jack Donovan's book kind of does get somewhat partially correct, is that you need something that's like defending the perimeter. You need a set of values that defend the perimeter of the, the social space prior to getting other ideas like like the free market or, you know, um, the public space off and running. Right. This is why Donovan's book is my favorite bad one on masculinity, because it's got so many important concepts in there, but mm -hmm. mixed up with some fundamental errors too. Yep. That yep. I think is a really interesting point to draw attention to, especially for this play, because the only reason scholars have the safe space in which mm -hmm. to spill ink on all these yes. kind of abstract higher problems is that the warrior has first of all spilt his blood to defend it. He spilled his blood in the past to, to found it and to defend it and continues to, uh, you know, this is, this is the Orwell quote about, you know, we, we sleep safely at night because rough men stand ready to visit violence upon those who would do us harm. So it's like, it's rough men ready to visit violence. It's not safe spaces and gender studies. Exactly. If, from a Christian point of view, what we're saying though isn't that somehow um, war is the ultimate foundation of reality. It's not a kind of um, Nietzschean vision derived from Heraclitus where right, right. order isn't inherent in the nature of things. So the, the Christian view is that something's gone wrong with the world. We're, mm -hmm. we're fallen. The whole world fell with us as well, even in a sense, the, the animal kingdom too. Mm -hmm. So, Yes, it's true that no bloodless myth will hold now, as Jeffrey Hill puts it in his great poem, Genesis, no bloodless myth will hold. That's why we get the, the crucifixion, and there's no bloodless way out of this mess. But mm -hmm. uh, on a deeper level, beneath war, there's the fact that all things long for order and peace. That's what the deepest reality is. Mm -hmm. Yes. But it doesn't change the fact that what we just said is true, given our, our current circumstances. Okay, mm -hmm. small detour then, but important. And we're just stressing that he, he fights for them. He comes back and he's not appreciated and he's frustrated because he knows that without him, they're not safe. Mm -hmm. I will fight against my country. And then men die. You are not my son. Coriolanus has grown from man to dragon. Make you a sword! Sweet. That's my revenge. So the next thing here is turning against his own country and mm. what the flaws in his character are. You saw the clips there with his wife and his mother and how he's willing to even turn against them in turning against Rome when he sides with the Volscian general Ophidius. Mm. He's turned from man to dragon. So 
we'll talk about this Achilles problem later on. I think one critic has really astutely pointed out that the, the hypothetical that Shakespeare's exploring in this play politically is what would happen if you dropped Achilles into the Roman Forum? Like, what happens then? Mm. Um, yeah. What do we do with this kind of character? And like all tragic protagonists, um, he's got his flaws, many of them. Not just one big one that we can pick out, as Aristotle thought, with the the singular um, Hamartia, so the one flaw. I don't think Shakespeare wrote his plays like that. There are multiple flaws, just mm. like human beings in real life have multiple flaws. But if you were to pick out one, probably pride would be Coriolanus's big flaw. Um, he's justified in having some proud in his great, uh, pride in his great accomplishments. And yet, to turn against the country of his birth and against his own family out of his desire for revenge, we're seeing someone who's overstepping the boundaries here. And that dragon imagery is drawing attention to that. What are your thoughts on this part of the play? Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, pride and um, I guess like uh, an excess of boldness, maybe an excess of, of the warrior virtues the martial virtues, uh, if William James were to express them, you know? So it's like he, the, he just is at this point. Yeah. He's not a warrior fighting on behalf of the, the, the demos. He's just a warrior, like fighting for the sake of war. And, uh, he's, he's un, uncoupled from, yeah, from the set of reasons that gave him that, I guess, uh, that sanction and those virtues to begin with. Yeah, exactly it. Um, later in the play, we'll get to when Menenius is kind of like a father figure to him. When he sees him having switched, side, switched sides to the Volscians, he says that he was a kind of nothing um, until he had forged a new identity for himself in, in the fires of burning Rome. So he doesn't really know what he is anymore. And he's using yep. war as a form of self-actualization. It's no longer about service. Yeah, reminds me of um, Kurt uh, in um, Apocalypse Now, where mm -hmm. uh, well, I mean, I guess the, the Heart of Darkness, you know, uh, version. Yeah, uh, where yeah, he's he breaks away and he just forms his own his own military in the in the in the Congo, uh, just yeah, for for self actualization purposes only, really. Yeah, this is a big problem if you look at. The psychological literature on combat trauma as well. That mm. book, Achilles in Vietnam, yep. what happens to men's sense of self in the horrors of combat. I think that although the play isn't explicitly looking at it in those terms, it's examining the same kind of psychological problems. So what does war do to your sense of self, especially when you go home and you're not valued mm. for what you've done? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's uh, Jonathan Shea and uh, Sebastian Younger's tribe. I think hits on this as well. Yeah, so it's like a, a lot of folks think that returning veterans are at present are, um, let's say, off kilter because mm. of what they saw in war. But a lot of times, it's. I mean, that might be the case, but it's also this double, double issue with respect to just inability to assimilate back into civilian society. Right. All right, so just finishing the trailer quickly. And uh, if you haven't watched that version yet, that's the one I'd recommend. That's the one I used to play in class when teaching this. It was a GCSE set text a few years ago. And, uh, yeah, all the, the students love that one. So that's my recommended version. Now, I'm guessing some people following along probably haven't read the whole play yet. So from uh, learning the hard way in teaching in schools, I'm going to begin with a plot synopsis so we're not too lost as we go through. Otherwise, people might find it difficult jumping around when looking at different uh, key quotations. So mm -hmm. coming up now on the screen, you've got a diagram of who's who 
and what social circle they move within. So the Romans, the Volscians, and then we've got overlapping with the Romans who are all centered around Coriolanus in the center there. We've got the citizens and the tribunes. So follow along as we go through this and then it will make sense. So we begin with Menenius trying to calm a mutiny among the Roman citizens over the way they've been treated by the nobles. His friend Caius Martius treats them with contempt and the citizens disperse. But Martius's attitude arouses the anger of the tribunes. You can see them here in the bottom left circle. The tribunes are like the link between the people and the government, essentially. Think of it like that. So his attitude towards the, the plebs, the people, arouses the contempt of their representatives. So we open up then, Mike, with citizens in mutiny because of how they've been treated by the nobles. Why do you think that is? What kind of theme is this emphasizing right from the outset? Uh, so I guess um, questions of desert, questions of egalitarianism and uh, roles and status within society. You know, what, what does one deserve as uh, a citizen within a polis? Yeah, sure. Class conflict, isn't it? The elite mm -hmm. versus the commoners. That's one of the things we begin with. And the structure of Shakespearean tragedy progressively moves towards disorder over the course of the play, ultimately ending in the death of at least the protagonist and also many others, death being the ultimate form of disorder. A comedy, um, by contrast, is defined by the fact that it ends in a marriage. So comedies tend towards order, tragedies tend towards disorder. We think of comedy nowadays as being about ha-ha, funny, slapstick, but the way mm. that Shakespeare thought about it and the other writers at the time was order, and marriage is the supreme form of that. Mm -hmm. Mm. So we're beginning with a small seed then of disorder, this conflict between the people and the nobles, and we're thinking what it's going to flower into. And Martius, who's later going to win the title of Coriolanus, he's the great general, and he's got nothing but contempt for the people. They don't embody the kind of higher virtues and values that he thinks Rome should truly aspire to. Who does embody them? Well, of course, he does, and men like him, because without him, they wouldn't be a Rome. So news then arrives that the Volskis, you can see all of them in the right-hand circle, level with the Romans, are in arms under Ophidius, who has been sent to attack Rome. Volumnia and Virgilia, so Martius's wife and mother, proudly discuss Martius's earlier feats and are visited by Valeria, who reports Martius's arrival at the Volscian city of Coriolis. Then the generals, Comenius and Titus Lartius, attack. Martius plays a major role in several skirmishes, and there's a fight between him and Ophidius, after which Coriolis is captured. For his part in the battle, Martius is given the honorary title of Coriolanus. And then he returns to Rome, where he finds his family and finds himself nominated for a consulship. So this is like a big uh, political role. Um, think of it almost like... Uh, being an MP uh, nowadays. So, the honorary title is one of the most important celebrations you can possibly have in Rome. He gets a, a triumph when he comes home. So this is like the highest accolade you can get as a soldier. So think of it as like the apex of his career so far, which is already fairly decorated. And then... He's got this difficult situation because for the nomination to be valid, he has to present himself humbly to the people to get mm. their votes. And he doesn't really want to do this. He doesn't like the people. <laughs> no, he doesn't like the people. Yeah. Though he really begrudges needing their votes. Remember, the first thing we saw right at the start of the play was him treating the people with contempt because they don't really, to him, uh, represent what the Roman ideal should be. So the people do give him their votes in the end, 
But Brutus and Sicinius, the tribunes, who don't like the way he spoke about the people before, portray him as the people's enemy, and the people then change their minds. So when Corydonus finds out about this, bearing in mind he's already angry and did it begrudgingly, when he finds out they've changed their minds, he can't contain his anger at all. So he speaks out against the people, and then they call him a traitor. Mm. So this is like the big turning point in the play because he's risked his life for them. And then they call him a traitor after having voted for him already. And you sympathize with him at this point in the play. But we'll look at the source material in Plutarch's Life of Coriolanus because this is uh, based on historical characters. There's a great line where Plutarch basically says um, Coriolanus simply couldn't conceive that losing his temper at this point wasn't a mark of manliness. It was actually to do with weakness. So he wasn't meek. He couldn't control his rage where a stronger man would have been able to. So this is where we start to get different interpretations of what it means to be a man because on mm -hmm. the surface of it, it seems like, you know, when you watch his speech, we'll come to it later. When the people banish him and he basically turns around and says, no, 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 you guys have got this <laughs> wrong. I banish yeah. you. Yeah, and yeah. Just stands there, one man facing down the crowd. And it gets me fairly pumped up when I watch it. He's got some mm -hmm. good points there. But still, that remark from Plutarch is quite cutting because uh, a real man isn't going to lose his temper and fly off the handle um, in ways that he shouldn't. It's good to get angry sometimes, but you only want to do it at the appropriate level. So the confrontation gets pretty violent and then the people threaten to kill him and then he has to leave. But his family and friends then say, no, no, look, go back, calm down speak mildly to them and begrudgingly he agrees again but he can't control himself at the taunts it's just too much for him and he gets banished and then Volumnia gives some really harsh words to the tribune it's one of my favorite bits in the play when she says compared to my son and what he's done for Rome your entire careers amount to nothing basically you're like uh, you know stumbling half men compared to him he's a god compared to you so the tension between the the warrior and the smooth mouthed um hollow mouthed uh politician is a big one in the play would you mm. agree mike yeah certainly yep and they uh yeah a perennial <laughs> perennial <laughs> uh, story as well yeah i think shakespeare was really uh alive to this problem because mm -hmm. It's the um, it's basically the Achilles Agamemnon dilemma from the Iliad, yeah. where yeah. you've got a weak king or you know weak political ruler, and the warrior overshadows him. You get it in Macbeth as well when Duncan, the king at the start of the play, can't put down the threat to the kingdom from the north. Macbeth, the Achilles figure, is able to do that and starts getting into his head that you know what why do I need this king? Like he can't even defend himself. I should be king. Mm -hmm. So that's the tension between the two. And it comes back to that perimeter defense that you mentioned right at the start. Yep. So while the, all this is going on, the Volscians have taken up arms again and Corydonus goes to offer his services to Aphidius. And guess what? He says, yeah, you, you know what? We, we could use a guy like you. Um, I've fought you before. I know how, talented you are and what a great asset you'd be so if you want to join forces with us and attack rome because you want revenge sure we'd love to have you so rome hears of this and as you'd expect a guy that they were already struggling with aphidius mm. but at least had corylanus to uh, save them from now has corylanus on his side there's complete mm. panic and the people yeah. now start to realize what we were talking about at the start, Mike, which is that you need guys like this, even if you might not like them. Mm -hmm. yep. So yep. they send 
supplicants to ask Coriolanus to spare Rome. Look who's begging now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's um didn't this happen somewhat with Alcibiades? I mean not to that extent, but didn't he, he end up switching sides over something? Yeah, I have to look it up. I think that's right though. I remember reading a footnote about that um when I was looking for the um source material for this play see if we can find it in a second but i think the uh the rejected warrior who then turns the tables and then threatens the city that rejects him um that's a that's a motif it's a, a problem to do with the pride of the people as well being broken because this is pretty much the exact situation that they found themselves in earlier with Martius having to, to beg them. Now it's the opposite. And he warned them that this would happen. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Just before he was exiled, this is exactly what he warned of, that there would be a threat of some sort and they would then find themselves defenseless. Yeah. So mm -hmm. the supplicants go um, saying, please spare Rome. And he rejects them at first. Cominius and Menenius both try and they find him completely implacable. Um, they, they say that there's no more milk in him, like the milk of mercy, than in a male mm. tiger. And mm. he's grown from man to dragon. So there's nothing to be done, no reasoning. So then they decide, why don't we send his family? Mm. Let's send Volumnia, Virgilia, Valeria, and his little son as well. And then uh, they eventually succeed. It's, it's too much for him to say that he's going to not only destroy Rome, but also his family too in the mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. um, this is seen as weakness, though, by Ophidius, who regards it as a betrayal. So Rome is rejoicing at this point. Um, and annoyingly for Ophidius, Coriolanus, being who he is, uh, great charisma, etc., and with his decorated military career, the Volscians have started to like him. Um, they are hero worshipping him, and Aphidius is getting really jealous. It represents a threat to him. So, given this betrayal that he's just witnessed, he starts to meet with some conspirators. And when Corydonus comes back from the deal he's made with Rome, based on the pleas from his mother, Ophidius just says, that's it, you're a traitor, and we're going to kill you, which they do. But straight away, after he's dead, Ophidius regrets what he's done, and the Volscians give him a noble funeral. So, it's a bit like in the Iliad, except Achilles, or Coriolanus is the one who who dies rather than Hector mm -hmm. and straight away after he's dead his executor realizes what he's done and he gets a hero's funeral anyway so I think it's interesting to bear in mind that no matter what happens in the rest of the play he does get a hero's funeral so we're going to point out quite a few of the the flaws in his character but it's important to recognize that even Ophidius at the end regrets treating him as a traitor. What do you think about the ending of the play, Mike? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, it is a, a culmination of tragedy for, for the, the, the warrior cast, you know, an exemplar of the warrior cast in, in a, a functioning society. And um, yeah, he is flawed and he kind of does get what he deserves. I mean, particularly for, I know Aphidius might think that, okay, that, you know, there's a moral equality of combatants. This is an honorable combatant, but like he is kind of a traitor against his, his home, right? Like, you know, he, despite all of his, um, his grievances, maybe justified grievances, but I think it's a bit far to switch sides and then attack your own home. Uh, it's a bit, bit of a drama queen <laughs> overreaction. Um, but yeah, he's flawed and he, he does have some, he does have some 
justified grievances. And I think to, to my mind, it's, I mean, it's, it, it really is like, it's a, it's a damned if you do damned if you don't like tragedy that he, that he gets himself into. And it's, I don't know if there's any, any, uh, way that it that can re resolve, you know, it's a pessimistic play in that sense mm. because mm -hmm. these are really thorny questions that don't have any easy solutions. And it, it might yeah. be the case that with guys like this, the pros are also the cons and that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just depends on yeah. the context. Yep. We'll talk more about that when we get to that particular scene. I liked this quick encapsulation of the play by Victor Kahn. This play contains many elements familiar from other tragedies and histories of Shakespeare. The subject is politics and at its centre is the mob, an uglier group than the one portrayed in Julius Caesar or Henry VI Part Two. One prominent theme is how the struggle for political power gives rise to an inner conflict. Responsibility to the state versus fidelity to one's integrity. Hmm. A few of your remarks so far today, Mike, have actually picked up on that particular conflict. Like, what does it mean to emphasize integrity over responsibility to the state? And how easily do those two things sit together? That's a big question that every soldier has to answer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So we see it elsewhere. Brutus in Julius Caesar, Antony in Anthony and Cleopatra. Uh, T.S. Eliot, by the way, a critic who's got really good judgment, in my opinion, said that Coriolanus and Anthony and Cleopatra were Shakespeare's two most fully realized, most accomplished plays. So people who enjoy this one, I would recommend Anthony and Cleopatra to read alongside it. And mm. that one's a lot more about what happens to a man when he puts a woman first in his life? So basically, like Antony is the ultimate study of simping. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The title and character. I guess Cor Coriolanus would be, is sort of the what happens when the, the warrior ethos is put as the, the highest good, perhaps. Yeah, right. I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, so much so that he he's even uh, ashamed of yielding to his own mother. So mm. there's that line when he, he says that it's a most unnatural dis scene when he's like, okay, fine, mom, I won't destroy you alongside Rome. <laughs> um, it's not unnatural. It's like supremely natural uh, to yield in that moment. But he uh, even that tie, mother, child, and more broadly speaking to like the, the nation as in um, natality, natal to birth, Mm. Um, even that tie for him is one that he tries to break. He, one of his lines is break all bonds. So he just sees himself mm. as this like abstract war machine when he says, mm. make you a sword of me with no kind of ties at all of loyalty. Yep. So I think that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Uh, the title character grows in self-awareness, but is destroyed by a world in which he can no longer function. Mm. That's an interesting remark, isn't it? Yep. Yep. A world in which he can no longer function, but he's grown in self-awareness. That is the predicament of the returning soldier in many ways, isn't it? It is. Uh, it reminds me also, there is a book by uh, Joe Haldeman called The Forever War. And uh, it's about returning Vietnam veterans, and it's set in space. And it's uh, they, they deploy to various parts of the galaxy, and their timeline is off when they, you know, because of the space-time continuum, when they return back to Earth, they're on the same timeline, but the rest of the Earthlings have changed. And he finds that the um, as they keep going after these deployments to like fight the aliens, when they come home, he finds two things, that the, um, the civilians are more and more androgynous, such that the men and women can't become, they're, they become increasingly indistinguishable. <laughs> and and the, um, the aliens whom they're fighting start becoming part of the the demos that um you know that they're ostensibly protecting so at some point like the characters that are soldiers they just decide to just keep fighting for they, it makes more sense of them to just be on a perpetual deployment than to be back home oh, you know, i see not functioning in society so they yeah they just opt to just fight war for the sake of doing it just to, because it's the only thing that makes sense to them 
Well, it, it, I suppose it would give them a sense of self and purpose, wouldn't it? So no, no war, no identity, which is a yeah. And the the, the values that they they make sense to them are on the yeah. front, not not back in in the soft civilian space that that can't make sense to them either. That reminds me, actually, the the military historian Martin von Creveld, he mm. he reckons that even without competition for scarce resources, human nature is such that there would still be war just as a way of getting a sense of identity of us versus them. He thinks that the, the bellicosity of human nature is such that we tend that way even without the uh, competition for scarce resources, which is quite an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. yeah, William James is the moral equivalent of war also talks about this. I mean, James, I mean, being a pacifist still thinks that it would be a tragedy of human spirit if we just became <laughs> like feminists and bureaucrats and clerics and <laughs> yeah. uh we you know we need to seek trials by nature to to keep the the martial virtues alive there's, there's there's responses to um the problem of natural evil i mean moral evil's got its root in free will but the, the question of why there's suffering and bad things in the world people like hilaire belloc and chesterton and others basically just said a, a world of perfect ease and comfort just wouldn't give you the same kind of opportunities for moral development as a tough one would so what looked to us like bad things are actually there for our good mm -hmm. yeah yeah so we're conscious of the relationship between the welfare of a ruler and the health of the state a theme at the heart of julius caesar hamlet Macbeth, king lear and all the history plays and that big concept that the, the state is basically the soul of the ruler, writ large, that's familiar to us, isn't it? We've looked at that in our philosophy reading selections. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. When we covered, uh, was it book 10 or 11 of uh, Plato's Republic, where he goes through the, the four four tiers of the, the degenerating uh, state and the corresponding degeneration of the, the citizen uh, that it embodies. Exactly right. So Shakespeare is yep. a political philosopher dealing with the same kind of mm -hmm. abstract concepts, but in the concrete form of character, and plot and drama, which is mm -hmm. good for helping people to think about them because it engages your imagination a bit more. At least that's why I like literature anyway. Oh, yeah, certainly. Certainly. I think that, uh, I mean, something like 1984 gives a much more panoramic account of like political philosophy than than most dry political philosophy text yeah that i don't know about you but that's often the way i'll get interested in a philosophical problem is mm -hmm. because a literary narrative or character has got under my skin and really mm. yep. grabbed me with it and shaken me with it like the brothers karamazov does this with theological problems better than pretty much any theology essay you can read mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep yep okay right so what we want to look at now is basically a few of our favorite quotes from across the play um, explaining the development of the character of Coriolanus. Why is he presented the way he's presented? And Reuben Brower is the critic who gives the insight that I want to take as the starting point for our reading of the character. He says, suppose we set Achilles down in the Roman Forum what then? Achilles in the Roman Forum, what happens next? The mm -hmm. whole play is an investigation of that problem. So integrating hyper-masculinity in some ways, but also effeminacy in others in that you can't control your temper um, into society. In other words, in other words, it's the, the problem of toxic masculinity. And Plutarch's <laughs> life of Coriolanus has an interesting paragraph about him this Martius's natural wit and great heart did marvelously stir up his courage to do and attempt notable acts but on the other side for lack of education he was so choleric and impatient that he would yield to no living creature which made him churlish uncivil and altogether unfit for any man's conversation so we've got courage here which is a great thing but we've also got the inability to get alongside with people in peacetime society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep 
Yeah. Yeah, you need both in order to be a functioning human being to an extent, though. I mean, right? It's like if it's a completely corrupt society, then, you know, or totalitarian society, then, then there's a good reason to, to be angry and, and uh, polemical. Exactly. That's it. But when it's not required, we need to tone it down a bit. You need to be mm. able to tone it down. The question is, can he do that? And it seems right. like yep. the historical character, the. Plutarch is recording here, had great difficulty with that. Shakespeare's mm -hmm. seen some good raw material for an exploration of this problem. So those yep. who saw with admiration how proof his nature was against all the softnesses of pleasure, the hardships of service, and the allurements of gain, while allowing to that universal firmness of his the respective names of temperance, fortitude, and justice, Yet, in the life of the citizen and the statesman, could not choose but be disgusted at the severity and ruggedness of his deportment, and with his overbearing, haughty, and imperious temper. Mm. So, painting a nice character picture of what he was really like then. The ideal soldier, but a terrible statesman. This reminds me of like if uh, George S. Padden were... Uh made to be a uh some type of congressman or something it'd be, yeah it'd be, it'd be, it'd be just an tr absolute train wreck <laughs> that's it you, you know what that's a really good point because um uh aristotle uh said that poetry is truer than history because what you're looking at are concrete universals so mm. um coriolanus is like an abstraction of pattern and all the guys like him and mm. when you're studying him you're studying all of those figures from history yeah. so perfect example mike mm -hmm. yep. education and study and the favors of the muses confer no greater benefit on those that seek them than these humanizing and civilizing lessons which teach our natural qualities to submitted to the limitations prescribed by reason and to avoid the wildness of extremes. So that idea of the wildness of extremes and where you can overstep the proper boundaries of manhood, I think is one of the mm. things that the play is really setting out to explore. Mm. Yeah, very much so. Yep. In, um, yeah, in the individual case and then, yeah, in the collective case too. Yeah, almost. exactly. That's it. And I don't know how many people uh, are familiar with the fact that Shakespeare basically didn't invent any plots or characters. He just took them from history books, like mm, Plutarch's mm. lives, and saw what were essentially rough diamonds in these character portraits, and mm. then uh, exercised his artistic powers on honing that and really getting all the literary qualities to bring out the potential. So mm. It looks like plagiarism um, to us now when we're thinking about, hey, you didn't you didn't make up the the plot for your story, mm, um, right? Right. But that's not what he's really interested in. So mm. uh, we're told that he had always indulged his temper and had regarded the proud and contentious element of human nature as a sort of nobleness and magnanimity. We mentioned pride earlier, and mm -hmm. for Martius. To be proud is, in his mind, to be the same as to be great, to be great sold, magnanimity, mm. magna great, right. and then anim for mind, spirit, or sold. So mm. for him, like humility is something that would diminish his greatness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. I guess uh, Alexander was very much this way as well, you would think, with, uh, yeah, that, yeah, any, any sort of like, great general of history probably had that sim similar similar trappings yeah which should, as tempted as we are to ad admire what is properly masculine in characters like this and there really is good stuff you've got to remember that in this respect they are basically the opposite of the true model, uh, model of masculinity which is christ who right. emptied himself yep. of his divinity and became um, like the lowest of the low, basically mm -hmm, born mm -hmm. on the stable floor. So yep. if, if you're wondering where to find the chink in the presentation of um, 
masculinity and Corey Lonus, then it is there. It is in thinking that um, pride is somehow the the key to manhood and humility has no place in it. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, he becomes so proud he wants to like attack his own home and his own family. I mean, yeah, that's a bit... <laughs> that's a bit. <laughs> Something went wrong along those, uh, those lines at some point. Yeah, Exactly right, yeah. So uh, reason and discipline had not imbued him with that solidity and equanimity, which enters so largely into the virtues of the statesman. Straightforward and direct, and possessed with the idea that to vanquish and overbear all opposition is the true part of bravery, and never imagining that it was the weakness of his nature that broke out, so to say, in these ulcerations of anger. Martius retired, full of fury and bitterness against the people. Mm. So that, I think, is the insight I mentioned earlier, where Plutarch has spotted that losing his temper in that way was a form of weakness. So the meek man, the truly masculine man, he has the right amount of anger in the right way at the right time, etc. about mm -hmm. the right things. Whereas yep. uh, Martius, as you were saying, he had some justified grievances. Like he should have been a bit angry about the way they treated him, but not that angry. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we we're looking at the, uh, the fact that he gets a hero's funeral. And I just want to start at the end with the Phidias's oration over the dead body. My rage is gone, and I am struck with sorrow. Take him up. Help. Three of the chiefest soldiers. I'll be one. Great image of Ophidius himself, bearing the body. Beat thou the drum, that it speak mournfully. Trail your steel pikes. Though in this city he hath widowed and unchilded, Many a one, which to this hour bewail the injury, yet he shall have a noble memory. Assist. Last speech of the play. Ophidius has got his revenge now, but with the rage gone from him, he's able to appreciate the man who lies dead before him. And even though so many children are dead, and there are so many widows, he's still making sure this great nemesis of his gets a hero's burial. Hmm. Humility from Ophidius, do you think, Mike? You've done the wrong thing? Yeah, yeah I guess, I mean, I don't know if it's humility or at least maybe just a recognition of his... Uh, his martial equal, something like that, you know, moral equality of combatants. Um, yeah, that was my, my first association with it. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, there's, it's like shaking hands after a tough MMA fight or something, except it's mm -hmm. more extreme because he's actually vanquished totally being dead. But this is the opposite of what Achilles does in right, the yeah. Iliad and just dragging mm -hmm. Hector's dead body around Troy in a big mm -hmm. display. So yeah, yeah. Ophidius is the, the better man of the two here, and it's not a coincidence that his last word in the play is assist, whereas um, Martius, like, he doesn't want assistance from anyone ever. Mm. He's all about doing it by himself. Right. So There's right, an interesting right. contrast between the two of them. Was so, Martius' last line or last word? Um... Let me check exactly which one it was. I think it's when he's complaining that Ophidius has called him boy. And that is the, the word that's annoyed him most. And mm. he's saying that, no, no, no. It was uh, like an, evil, an eagle released into a dovecot. I fluttered your whole city. And it's all about boasting about what he's done. Mm. Wow. Um, what is ex his exact last line? Though? Let's have a look. Oh, no, I was right. It is boy. So um, he says here, one more speech after the boy one. Um, we've got, 
basically, don't you dare tell me, boy, I proved my manhood single-handedly um, destroying your city. And then we have his very last word is sword. Yeah, his last word is sword. Mm. Yeah, that was yep. a really good question then. So when he yep. says earlier, make you a sword of me, um, that's that single-minded focus on him as just the, the weapon of war himself. He says, oh, that I had him with six Ophidiuses or more, his tribe, to use my lawful sword. And then the conspirators come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the film version, they all stab him in the back, interestingly. Mm. So the, the last speech then um, about him draws attention to his heroic qualities. But the place that's done mainly is in the big encomium, so the speech of praise that Cominius gives when he's given the honorary title of Coriolanus for taking the city of Coriolis. And we'll be looking at this more next week, but the, the way in which it's structured is basically similar to what Homer and Virgil do with their formulaic set pieces in praise of great warriors. So Martius in getting this title is associated with that classical heroic tradition. So the speech begins, the deeds of Coriolanus should not be uttered feebly. It is held that valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver. If it be, the man I speak of cannot in the world be singly counterpoised. So when they're getting ready to award this title to him, what we're told before he enters the room is that this guy is unparalleled. There's nobody mm. who can equal him. And that's why he's got this big triumph and why he's going to be getting this special name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would, it would be like as if Patton got, uh, <laughs> <laughs> got, got a congressional nomination or something. Yeah. That's it, yeah. And e even the way that the opening of the speech is phrased with the deeds of Coriolanus as the first line, this is a, an echo of Homer with the glorious deeds of great heroes dead, except now they've actually got like a, a living, breathing Achilles walking mm. into the Roman Forum, as Ruben yep. Broer was saying. And the man I speak of, this is like um, in Virgil with the Aeneid singing of arms and the man. So that's basically the big theme of the play like those epic poems too um, manhood and war and the two of them going together to what extent is the martial life the masculine life there's overlap but is it the entirety of it what does it mean to be a man and not be at war these are the kind of questions that the play sets for itself to answer i don't think there are any easy answers but it does a better job of it than most uh mm -hmm. fictional works do certainly yeah, now, definitely my, my favorite Shakespeare play, the favorite Shakespeare character. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by, far, by far. Uh, yep. I mean, for obvious reasons. But yeah. the uh, pe People say that the uh, your favorite character, and Corey Lennis is probably my one too, your favorite Shakespeare character best reveals your own dark side. <laughs> mm. <laughs> <laughs> who, who do you know who said that um no i have to correct. find it it's up years yeah. ago but um that's uh I, I think it's true for most people and what's even yeah. more worrying for me is that there are some some big parallels between cory lanus and ahab in moby dick as well and he's another right. character that right. yeah, yeah. always resonated with there was a when i got sacked from eton one of the other masters who'd left the school recently he wrote a uh, an opinion piece on it in uh, the UK press. And he compared me to Coriolanus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so like the, uh, you know, com coming back for revenge afterwards. Or <laughs> right. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Made me laugh. Um, um, yeah. I shouldn't laugh. It's bad. It's a, it's a bad thing. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a bad person in that respect. Um, Anyway, the valor is the chiefest virtue and most dignifies the haver. That's what we're going to be looking at um, for pretty much the entirety of next lesson. 
the players an exploration of what valor means and what it means to place it as the highest virtue above everything else. Mm -hmm. So we'll go through his um, movement from boyhood to manhood, what he thinks manhood consists in, and also where that goes right and where it goes wrong. Good. Okay, so we've got context established today, a little bit of historical background with Plutarch. We've outlined some of the political problems that Shakespeare's set out to explore in the play. Hope everyone's enjoyed it. Tune in for next time. Watch that film version if you want to get a good overview of the play. Um, and also try and read the, the hard copy all the way through too. Nice. All right. Thanks a lot, Good Mike. Stuff. Good to see you. Same here. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Later.